All right, everyone. Welcome to Rhythm and Roads. I'm your host, Joshua Jacob. We have a very special guest with us, Orlando Loya. Welcome, sir. Hi. Hi, Joshua. <laughs> Hi, everyone. All right. So I, when you told me your story when at my work, I, I was just very inspired by it and moved by it. And I just felt very passionate about your story that I want you to come on and share. And so, I mean, it's I hear a lot of stories and I'm very inspired by a lot of stories, but I just feel like I want everyone to come on as much as I can to share. And so when I asked you about it, you were very just like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. And you're, you're positive and very, your energy and everything about you just really just, I was just like, wow, this guy's really cool. So I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to bring you on. So yeah. Thank um, you. you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, are you originally from El Paso? Where are you from? Yeah, so I'm originally from El Paso. I was born at Del Sol and uh, oh, wow, okay. I grew up. Yeah, I grew up here in actually in Clint. So I'm, I grew up in the lower valley and um, that was a um, that was an OK part of my life. You know, I really don't remember ever really feeling very happy mm. growing up for some reason. And uh, I really think it was because my parents didn't really know how to model unconditional love for yourself. And uh, that kind of set me, set me back in terms of my emotional development as a human being. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, and from in that part of your life, was it like when you were a child, when you're a teenager, like what was that point of in your life that you felt you weren't getting that unconditional love? Yeah, that was as a child, you know, and it really kind of came to a head when I turned 12 and uh, I realized that I was gay and I came out to my parents and, you know, um, for my dad, that was just too much. It was, um, I couldn't, I wasn't, I wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for him mm -hmm. that I was gay. And so he really kind of rejected me. And that, that, that's when it became, you know, a real thing that, uh, that I wasn't worthy of his love. Right. Man. And I and I bet that was very hard just for you because you're, you know, you want to get that unconditional love from your parents. And for them, you know, it was a shock, a surprise, but still it's it, like at their side, it was more like, how do we, you know, give that still unconditional love to them, you know? And um, so I, yeah, that's, that's really, I'm sorry that you went through that. I mean, it's not easy. And I bet a lot of people um, are going through that, you know, so. And continue on what happened after that. Yeah. So after my dad rejected me, I began looking for his love in the wrong places. Mm. Um, within about six months, I would end up having sex with a man. Um, mm. We were at a, we were actually at a, at a restaurant with my family. They were having dinner outside and a man at the, a drunk man at the bar caught my eye. And, you know, eventually he motioned for me to go into the restroom. And so, um, you know, I lost my virginity while my parents were outside eating dinner, you know. Wow. Um, yeah, not, not really, you know, the ideal way to, to have that, you know, wonderful first experience. And um, I remember it was painful. I remember I didn't enjoy it. But I do remember that, you know, for a few moments, I was like, I was like chosen by by this like male fatherly energy mm -hmm. and uh you know i began to reenact this pattern of being with unavailable men who could provide me that chosen feeling mm -hmm. um and it was it was really unhealthy for me you know uh, and i was i was probably 12 and a half 13 at the time and um i would i, I went on to have a, a lot of sex with a lot of random men from wow. the time I was about 12 to the time I was about probably 16 because I entered my first relationship then and it was it was very unhealthy you know um and eventually within about a year or two uh someone would give me meth for the first time uh, wow. uh, uh and so I began to be given this you know very hardcore drug at a very young age. At what age again? Uh, probably about 14. Dang, 14. So, okay, so you experienced what you did through the 
I guess, having sex with men that you were experimenting and getting that feel. And But you said it was not what you were looking for or something that was very uncomfortable, maybe because of what? like. Well, this is upon my reflection. You know, at the time, I really, this is what I really wanted. I wanted... I wanted an older man to kind of mm. choose me because I was looking for that fatherly love. Right, but upon figure, father figure. Yeah. Exactly. But upon reflect, you know, these are like my daddy issues. But upon reflecting, it's like, you know, what I really needed was to just be loved by my dad and be given a space mm. to experiment in a healthy way with people who were my own age, or, you know, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have been so um I just shouldn't have been in those situations, you know. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then you, when you did meth at 14, what was the journey from that point on through your late teens? And then like from there, how, like what happened through from that? Yeah. You know, meth, um, meth releases a very large amount of dopamine into your brain, something that's completely unnatural and it's not supposed to be experienced by a human being. Wow. Um, and it, it, it makes a lot of physical changes in your brain, things that um, I didn't know that were happening at the time. You know, I didn't understand what the consequences were going to be because of these actions. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, although I, it was my choice to uh, to go and do these things, I, I, I still was a child. And so it's kind of, um, you know, I, I, still, I still have to take responsibility for them, though, for me. And, um you know, I began to see this person who's giving me meth more often because it, it's very addictive, you know, that although um, the feeling of the euphoria is very intense, it also comes with this feeling of anxiety and paranoia and depression that happens afterward. And um, I uh, I continued to, uh, to use for about two years. Wow. Uh, yeah yeah and it would be you know maybe on a maybe on a monthly to a bi-monthly basis and um it affected me really negatively i started to you know not perform very well in school i started to kind of retract away from being a person i didn't you know being so afraid of the world because of the paranoia that meth brings Mm -hmm. i just wasn't able to fully engage and uh, with the world in general, you know, so um, things started to kind of fall apart. And um, I, I was kind of saved. Um, I found that Adderall taking unprescribed Adderall that I would buy from my friends could kind of give me a similar feeling to what the meth would give me. Oh, okay. um, and so that kind of saved me my last two years of high school. And I by the grace of God, I graduated. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. So I did graduate high school. That was good. And I did try to go on to college. But um, upon graduating high school in Houston, um, my family left. And so I ended up staying by myself in Houston. And that was a recipe for disaster because I had no accountability as to, you know, uh, showing up for school, showing up for work. Mm. Um you know, whereas my family were kind of holding me in still a little bit, I was completely given the reins to do whatever I wanted now. And that was, uh, that's where it kind of the real downfall began. Oh, man. And so like, from the chapter of you going from meth, and then you, and then it seemed like you graduated from high school. So that was a good, you know, outcome in your life. But then what made you feel like you wanted to go to Houston, and then kind of like go that route to still go in the downfall, you know, instead of, I mean, what was your process of thinking that, you know? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I did skip, I did miss something. So I did live in Houston for my whole high school, um, the whole high school period. So I was already living there. And about uh, six months before I graduated, I met someone, I met this man named Sergio. He was 15 years older than me. And, um, you know, we started kind of dating and, it was someone that I could take care of me and that I could, uh, I could kind of depend on as a, as a fatherly figure. Cause I, I sure couldn't take care of myself, mm-hmm. you know, at that point, but he definitely, you know, could try. And, um, when I graduated high school, you know, I really liked Houston. Mm-hmm. El Paso was kind of this place that I had grown out of and 
you know, being in the big city with, um, with the, I love the greenery, honestly, that was one of my favorite things about Houston, Oh, I bet. but, um, yeah, so I don't know, it was just kind of, a. it kind of seemed like, I don't want to say that it was like disrespectful to myself to move back to Houston, but it seemed like it's something that, I mean, move back to El Paso, but it was something that I had outgrown. Okay. And so when you got into this relationship with this man that's 15 years older than you, like from that point, what happened with, like you said, it went downfall. So what other events happened in your life from there? Yes. Yeah. So I began, I introduced him to meth. Mm. Uh, yes. Also, And although, I'm sorry, but you said you went with meth for two years. So I, I, I did use meth for about two years from the time I was 14 to 16. Oh, okay. Uh, And then I found Adderall and that kind of helped me to reduce my meth use mm -hmm. during the, the next two years from 16 to 18. Oh, okay. Um, but then, you know, meth was still something that was kind of on my mind and that, that I, I was wanting to do. Uh -huh. And so at, by the time I turned 18, I did decide to introduce Sergio to it Oh, and try I see. to, Okay. yeah, and try to normalize it. So that way it could be something that I could participate in. Uh, Oh, with my okay. partner dang yeah <laughs> <laughs> well and and i remember you mentioning uh, when i met you that i guess you went through a phase of um i guess going to bars a lot or drinking a lot to a point that it was kind of not being very good for your health oh yeah for sure for sure so uh, along with the Uh, with the meth use, you know, especially once I turned 18 and everything kind of went crazy. Um, that's when I really started to go out a lot, um, mm. you know, and introducing meth to my partner. I also, you know, we started to do that more often. Um, and things just really kind of got out of hand over the next, it took two years for things to really get out of hand. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I found a very dark place with all my drug use and all my drinking. Uh, it was just, um, it was hard, you know, and it, I dropped out of college at that point because I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't juggle, you know, my, my alcohol use, my uh, drug use, my work and my school. So I dropped out of college. And then, um, after that I did, you know, it started to affect every part of my life. I became so afraid of the world. Um, wow. and the, uh, yeah. And, the, you know, at work, it really started to affect me negatively. I couldn't perform and, After two years of of just complete and other chaos, I finally um, I finally tried to to kill myself for the first time. Wow! Yeah, damn. Yeah, I'm using a drug overdose, and uh, you know, Sergio, my partner, ended up finding me in the act, and was oh, in the act! Wow. yes, was able to um, transport me to the hospital because I already consumed quite a bit of quite a bit of meth. And, um, you know, I was I by the grace of God, I was saved by the people at the hospital and I went to rehab for the first time. Wow. Jeez. And if and that's the thing, if he wasn't there at that time to get you, you I, we probably wouldn't even have this. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the timing of everything for him, for, to, sure. to, for him to walk in the room and see you, you know, and get you the help. Cause... Yeah. Cause that's all God, you know, that, that, that's God working in my life because mm -hmm. if it was up to me, obviously like I, I wouldn't still be here, but you know, God has a plan. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately I don't, fortunately I don't have a say in that plan. Well, that's, you're definitely right on that. He does, God does have a plan for you. Cause yeah, I mean, you're still here. So that, but you know, that's incredible. The fact that, that you just were at the point of losing hope. You're at a dark place in your life and you were just like, you know what, this is it. I just can't go on this anymore. And I felt that God will use certain people in your life in people's lives for certain reasons. You know what I mean? Even if, I don't know if you're still with this gentleman or not, but it's just that this, there's certain seasons when people 
meet people or they leave your leave in your life and they come in your life. But there's certain people that come in your life for a certain important reason, you know, every aspect of life. And I mean, look at that. I mean, just for this gentleman to come and and see you at your at the end of your rope where you were just barely leaving this earth and grabbed you and just saved you, you know, and then that, like you said, that's the grace of God getting you back, you know, and to the light, to life again. Because you, man, I mean, not everyone has that. Not everyone can get that opportunity where someone's going to come and get them. Sometimes it's too late. And that's, the, sure. and, and that's the saddest part is when it's too late, you know? No, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, because you're, I mean, we just have this one life, you know what I mean? There's no, can I go back? Can I try it again? You know, I'll, I'll do, you know, it's just, that's it. That's it, you know? So, I'm man, I'm so glad you're still here. I am really glad because your story will really help a lot of people. A lot of people. So, Thank so that, you. so after you went to the hospital and then you, I guess, like coming back to life and, and taking care of yourself, what was your thoughts process of like, I guess, thinking, man, I really need, a, I really need to take a hold of my life and change. I really need to do something about this because you're at your, you were at your lowest now, you know, what was that? What was that change like? For me, um, that didn't happen yet. I oh, okay. still, that, that was where my recovery journey really began because I started to want to recover mm. for Sergio's sake. Oh, I see. But okay. Exactly. But um, for me, like myself, I still didn't care about me. I still didn't love oh, myself wow. enough to want to get better for me. And um, that was kind of my downfall for, you know, the first maybe... Um, probably for the for the next year and a half while I tried to get sober I continued to relapse because underneath I just I didn't for some reason it just it still hadn't clicked for me mm -hmm. um and that was that was hard you know to mm -hmm. on the outside have these conflicting ideas of on the outside you know being this um being someone who doesn't love myself I became kind of a people pleaser and so, you know, going into rehab, going into the rooms of AA, going into the rooms of CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous, um, you know, I wanted to be liked. And so I, I understood the program on a surface level. I understood what I needed to say in order to get to talk to someone. I wanted, I understood all these things. Um, but inside, I was still in so much pain and so much darkness. Um, yeah. And um uh, you know, I, I, I started to learn a lot, though. That's that, that's something that I, I'm really grateful for is God's grace. God's mm -hmm. because, you know, although I wasn't ready to get sober at that point, um, God gave me time. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what I needed, because it took about a year and a half before I had uh, this most recent relapse, which was about four months ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was where. I attempted to to kill myself again. Oh um, wow! Four months ago. Yeah. Four months ago. Yeah. Dang! And I just met you like what a month ago. <laughs> yes. Man, yeah. no way. This oh. is all very recent. You know, I'm still very much in the process of recovering. Although it's a lifelong thing to you know stay sober from alcohol, from meth, from all all my mind altering substances. It's a, a lifelong process of growing right, and learning right. how to love myself. Um, right. This is still very recent for me. But I, the big difference that happened, you know, when I tr when I attempted the second time was that um, was that it was God, you know, God is the one who saved me that time again. Um, but it was just me and him. And that's, that's when I finally, I decided to, um, to jump off my balcony. Whoa. And, yeah. And I, I fell four stories. Whoa. And, uh, you know, that one, there was, there was not, there was absolutely nothing in my power that I could have done to, you know, alter the outcome of that. And, um, yeah. and I, and by God's grace, you know, again, I am okay. Uh, I, I did fracture vertebrae and I did have to spend, you know, about two weeks in the hospital, but for, um, for what I 
how I attempted, you know, it was like, um, it was very minimal. The doctors were very surprised that I was as good as I was. And, wow. you know, today I, uh, I'm walking, you know, I don't have any permanent injury. My fractures have healed. Uh, wow. And that's what it really took. That's what it took for me to finally say, you know, like, what the hell am I doing with myself? Like, why, why, why don't I love myself enough to put my foot down and be like, you know, I deserve, I deserve happiness. I deserve peace. I deserve joy mm -hmm. and finally make a beginning on, you know, like discovering what it means to actually love myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that began with moving away from Houston, mm, um, you know, people, places and things and moving back home. Right. And I think that's the big difference. That was the thing that I was missing that was keeping me from staying sober was okay. that I was living in Houston by myself. Mm, okay. So now that you're back in El Paso, um, where are things at now for you? Things are so much better, you know, like... That's good. I went back to rehab for a second time. And although it wasn't as impactful as my first time in rehab, mm -hmm. you know, I, I got everything that I could out of it. And I had learned so much over the last year and a half of trying to stay sober, you know, doing it one day at a time, um, taking it easy on myself, you know, all these sayings that they have in AA and mm -hmm. NA and CMA, they, they work because people stay sober, you know, and, and I'm, I truly believe that it can work for me too, because I see it working in other people's lives. Awesome. Um, cool. So things are, it's going really well. You know, That's I've great. recently started a new job and. Oh, good for you. Nice. And it's great. You know, yeah. like I'm just doing, everything is going really well. Awesome. I'm so happy for you, Orlando. Oh my God. What a story. Um, I know we have about seven minutes left. Do you have anything to share to the viewers and just anything with hope, anything just to, for those that are maybe going through some hard time, going through struggles, going through maybe depression, anything. Yeah. You know, like something that I'm, I'm learning is that like God doesn't do anything for like no reason, you know? And it's like, for me, I've learned that the people that help me the most are the ones who have been there are the ones who know that struggle. And so if you're going through something that's tough, like, you're going to get through it and you're going to be able to help someone else one day, just like I'm learning for myself. And so, mm -hmm. you know, reach out, ask for help people. Mm -hmm. I was afraid of the world at mm -hmm. one time mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm still working through it. It's a process. It's mm -hmm. not just going to lift you one day, right, right. but you know, that's okay. Like we're all going through something. So yeah. it's okay. Yeah. And I totally agree. We're all going through something. We all are, you know, it, some have it worse, some have it, you know, it just varies. Just, but everyone has something going on. And that's the thing. We always have to try our best to be respectful and just give a hand and help, you know, because we don't know someone might be going through something. We don't know, you know. So, yeah, wow, I totally, I totally agree. Wow, man, that that's just incredible story. Wow. And I'm so glad things are working out here in El Paso. And I, and I feel like from you going from Houston to El Paso, there was a reason why you left Houston to come here for it to work out here. You know what I mean? There's sometimes we don't like, well, I don't want to go back to El Paso, but there's a better place here. You know, there might be something here that will help you, you know? And so, exactly. And for me, that was my family. You know, I needed, right. I needed to come home. Um, unfortunately, my father passed away earlier oh, this year. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. Man. But it was okay. You know, it, um, he went out the way that he wanted. He, he was, a. Uh, he was a wonderful man, even though he didn't know how to love me as his gay son. You know, mm -hmm. I, I forgive him for for his shortcomings. And we've had our discussions, you know, healing ourselves and, um, you know, coming back home to the family. I, I have been able to begin my healing journey with them. And I think that that's been huge. And I'm so grateful awesome. to them yeah. to be able to, you know, take me back in now. And, uh, you know, they're definitely there. There's been. I haven't been, there's no way that I was able to do this by myself. You know, oh, like no, there are so many people in my life, uh, April, Sergio, you know, my mom, my sister, Victoria, these people who have just been um, instrumental in awesome. my recovery. So awesome. that's a great support system when it's family and good friends that you have in your life. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm so sorry again for your loss of your father. I mean, I lost my mother two years ago to cancer, but just losing someone of your family members, it's just, it's devastating. I yeah. remember we talked about that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, but I'm really glad that your family is really giving you a great support system. And that's very important. You know, I really feel, I even tell all the friends that, you know, when they lose someone in their life or just going through something, family is really important. And it is, you know, friends, close friends, family, because they know they're probably the best that know you, you know, they mean your family, especially your family. They know you very well. So they know what you need, you know, but, yeah. and also God knows you very well too. So he knows what you need, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Better than I do. Right. Yeah. He bring, he's bringing <laughs> the right resources, the right people, everything's just coming together. Yeah. And that's the thing. We, we don't know the end of the chapter of the story of what we're on. That's why I wanted to do this podcast rhythm and roads, because we're all on a different road in life that God has put us on, you know, and, and this road, it's sometimes easy, sometimes not, but there's always a story that's going to help others to be inspired by. And there, and we all have a purpose here. You know, there's God's given us a purpose and for us to still be alive is, is a blessing. And so for you to still be here is a blessing because it's okay to not be okay because that's when God comes in and does what he needs to do. You know what I mean? For he's not, sure. he's not forcing you to be, you know, anything that he's trying to control you to be, but he's loving you unconditionally because he's your heavenly father. You know, mm. he, he as a heavenly father that was your you know father here on earth didn't give you your heavenly father in heaven is giving you your resources, family, friends, job. He says, I'll be your heavenly father. I'll be the father that you wanted to have, you know. So for everything sure. you're for everything you're sharing to me it was like, man, that's that's on point what God's doing in your life. So that's really impressive. It's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Orlando, Loya, I really appreciate you again being on Rhythm and Roads. Um, um, I just, I'm going to be posting this for, like shortly after because I really feel like oh, so many people are going to be inspired by your story. And I really hope you continue to share this with a lot of other people, you know. Uh, even our Zoom today, you can share this, but just whoever you meet, you know, maybe God will provide people in your life that you'll be like, oh, this is my time to share, you know. Or, hey, this, you know, it's not going to be forced on, but he will provide certain people in your life that you're going to be like, Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. Here's my story. For sure. No, right. thank you so much for having me. Awesome. And I would love to have you back. Hopefully, let's see, maybe uh, in the new year, we'll see. Maybe in chapter two. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> see how it's sure. going, you know? Yeah. But all right, everyone. Well, thank you for watching. This is Rhythm and Roads. And we had our special guest here, Orlando Loya. So we'll catch you next time.